Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today we'll talk about several topics, namely, what is the let's see world balance of steel? How we look at it going forward? What's our take on the Russian market? And a few comments about our Turkish asset here, MMK Metallurgy. Well, indeed, as previous speakers has stated, the steel industry in the world has extreme excess capacities. And in fact, this situation to persist several years going forward, and probably it will stay even longer, because it's dependent on how fast the excess capacities are being closed and eliminated, uh, what are the perspective for some markets as India and Africa to grow in demand and for Chinese to sustain achieved level of consumption of steel. Therefore, to state the situation, there are extreme excess capacities in the world. However, looking at the Russian market, mm, we know that our producers, the big three of Russian flat producers as Severstal, NLMK, and MMK, they all enjoy competitive cost advantage. Therefore, these players have to stay in the industry even with these excess capacities worldwide. What's happening, the situation that we are looking at, is that so far, yet looking small on the chart, but actually huge in real life, the amount of exports from China. Actually, we think that a year or two going forward, this number is to exceed 100 million tons every year being exported from China. Probably uh, the number will be close to 150 million tons, 150 million tons every year. That's almost 3 million tons every week being exported out of China. And that has to be consumed somewhere. When we look into the dynamics of exports, the global trade is growing, and there is still a limit to how big it can be. Americans, they are introducing limitations. Not every country is growing its consumption. Therefore, there is a limit to growth. And it's already happened. Looking at Russian situation, on the left chart, you see the situation developing from 2000 to 2015, and internally, domestically, Russian steel consumption grew by 80% over this time period. That's a lot. And looking at the import situation in Russia, there's always been, there have always been imports in Russia of some kinds of products previously high value added, and nowadays there are only three major groups of products that could be imported in Russia steel. In all other situations, Russia is a net exporter of steel. So what do we import? We import polymer coated, galvanized steel, and tin plate. That's it. Uh, the amount of potential imports is uh, varying between half a million and a million tons. And that's in the imbalance Russia has in imports. What's going to happen that all, with all announcements that took place in Russia, these imports are expected to cease in the near future. Namely, with hot deep galvanizing, the three majors, MMK, NLMK, and Severstal, announced new projects with uh, capacities ranging from 350 to 400,000 uh, tons a year. So uh, adding them together, that's a million. So uh, there's a lot of potential for new capacities installation in Russia in two or three years from now, because these major three has announced that in 2017 and 2018, there would be ramp up in those capacities. They are being contracted and uh, constructed at the moment, as we speak. 
There are also announcements about polymer-coated lines being installed in Russia. Therefore, these two segments, within two or three years, will have excess capacities in Russia, eliminating chances for imports of this product line to come into Russia. There are also ambitious uh, plans for BOEF and EF installations in Russia. But those just generally increase the total amount of steel produced in Russia, and Russia is a net exporter of steel. Uh, to sum up, this slide shows that in uh, product categories, which installations are, has been in, outlined on the previous chart, Russia will turn in several years going forward in absolute total net exporter in almost any category of products you can imagine. But what happens to Russia itself? The country is going to, through a relatively severe crisis, with the GDP decrease this year around 4.5 and 5 percent. That's a lot. And this decrease in GDP naturally converts in a substantial decrease in total consumption of steel in Russia. Look at this slide. It's minus 14 percent internal consumption of raw steel in Russia. Minus 14% in one year. That's a lot. We look through many forecasts as to what situation can be in five to ten years going forward. Optimistic scenarios say, well, by 2020, Russia is back to where it's been before. So in five years from now. Relatively pessimistic scenarios say that it will happen only in 2025. So, Russians are stuck with relatively weak internal consumption for five to ten years going forward, while capacities are growing. So that means that Russia will be pushing a lot to export. Uh, on the right side of the slide, there is an additional split by industry. The situation is more or less similar across all industries, that decrease in consumption is uh, substantial. Even uh, with uh, that range of announcements about the pipeline construction, all those announcements taken into consideration do not support the level of steel consumption that we had in 2014 and 2015. There will be drop. So Russia will be able to produce way much more and expo export way much more this year and going forward than before. Looking at MMK, historically, MMK has been a strong internal player in Russia. And we always prioritize our sales in Russia over export sales. So we are a domestic producer, and that's easy to understand if you look at the map of Russia where we are located. It's very far for us to export. In terms of, let's say, uh, monetary explanation, we have a transport disadvantage to our competitors, NLMK and Severstal, for exports in the range of uh, $20 to $25 per ton. Therefore, for us, it's instead not a disadvantage to export, but in other words said, it's an advantage to sell in the domestic market. Because in the domestic market, we have, let's say, so-called a home region with a range of 1,000 kilometers where we are the major player. That's where we stay and we want to stay. If you look at the split of sales going forward, a third is being exported. But in fact, one half of that third is being exported to CIS countries, namely Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan for us is a home market. Therefore, going forward, our true, if I may call it so, our true exports are only expected to be one sixth of the total volume. So that means that we are majorly, and namely, a domestic player in Russia, and we are plan to, plan to stay so. And the announcement we made this July about the launch of process to construct a new hot deep galvanizing line by 2017 
is uh, the chance for us to close the niche market in Russia for hot, deep galvanized steel in three years from now, and that's it. Uh, in our product range investments, this is uh, probably the only notable thing that we are planning to invest in. Because it's on, the only segment in Russia for us that stays positive in terms of export import parity. It depends on imports, therefore it's attractive. Our asset in, uh, MMK, our asset in Turkey, MMK Metallurgy, functions well regarding to its rolling capacities. The production of hot, deep galvanized steel grows, and we are happy with the results. The asset is cash positive and generating positive returns. Yes, we don't see the opportunity this year or next year to launch EAF facility in Iskenderon. But our rolling mills, our hot, deep galvanizing facilities, working just fine. Therefore, bringing it together, I think that for the opportunity to export any hot deep galvanized steel and polymer coated steel to Russia within two or three years will totally vanish. And instead, there are major chances that Russia will convert itself into exporter of these types of products. For us, MMK Metallurgy is a major player in Turkish market, and it uses some of our hot rolled coils that we export here in Turkey and rework them. But in general, it's more or less stand alone profitably functioning asset. Thank you.